So, hi. Thank you, the few of you who have showed up. It's, it's much appreciated. Uh, my name is Robin. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist at SendGrid, which is an email uh, API company. Uh, MailJet are also here, which is quite funny. Uh, that's cool. Um, so I want to talk today uh, to you guys about the value of open source, um, which is something that's very, very, very important to me as a developer, something that's important to my company, something that's important to my friends and my community. Right? Open source is one of the most valuable aspects of being a software engineer. And I want to kind of get everybody excited about it and kind of maybe share some things you might not have known about it or help you get involved in any way you can uh, in open source. Um, so if you have any questions, you can get me on Twitter. I am at RBIN. Uh, or email me, robin at sengrid.com. I'll put that up at the end. You guys can get it then. Um, so d before I actually start, does anybody know what that is? What that, what that animal thing is? Does anybody know where it's from? No. All right. So has anyone heard of Go, the programming language? Yeah, so this is the mascot for Go, which is my personal favorite programming language. Um, the reason that's up there, it's not just because I love the programming language itself, I love Google for making it. The reason that's up there is because Go is an open source language. Um, just, you know, similar to the likes, of, the likes of Clojure and Rust, Go is an open source language, so they actually, Google, you know, um, kind of encourage developers to come on and contribute to the, the project itself, even though it's a hugely operational language and it's, it's very important, etc. Um, so there's open source all over, anyway. That, that, that's all that is. All right, so um, we'll just dive straight in. So what is, what is, for those who don't know, what is open source? So the terminology of open source really stands for three main things. It's software which can be freely used, software which can be freely changed or modified, and software that can be freely shared or distributed. Okay? Now, everybody knows that, right? But I kind of disagree that that's what open source means, right? As a terminology, maybe. But for me, open source is realistically about these three things, okay? It's an ideology. It's the want to make better software by opening up the contributor pool to the wider community of developers, okay? It's a want for free software and shared software, even if it's not free by money. It could be free as in, you know, freely shared, freely, you know, source code, open source, etc. Um, so for me, it's an ideology. Secondly, it's a focus on code. Obviously, with the tools like GitHub, tools like Bitbucket, open source is very, very much about the code of our software. That's what we're open sourcing, right? The code base. Obviously, being an engineer, this is what I like. I like code, so this makes sense. And the most important one, and the one that I think is the biggest thing that I will talk about a lot during this talk is community. Open source is about community. It's about a community of engineers or software developers, hackers, whatever we want to call ourselves, around a piece of software or a few pieces of software. Okay? And this is one that I'm really going to kind of try and drive home today. Community is like super, super mega important. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get into that. So a few kind of... Uh, Slightly more technical things on the, the open source thing. One of the things I wanted to mention is, is licensing. A lot of people open source their software, they put it on GitHub, they put it on Bitbucket, they release it to the world, and they don't really know about licensing it properly. They don't know the implications of not licensing it properly. Um, so I just want to cover uh, just a few of the main licenses that you'll see, just so I can kind of breeze over them. I don't have time to go into all of them because there are hundreds of licenses available. Uh, but I want to talk about the main ones. The first one being MIT license. Anyone seen MIT licensing? Pretty much, pretty much anybody who's used GitHub will see MIT licensing. It's the, it's the default license GitHub wants you to use, and it's one of the most common licenses that you will see. And what MIT stands for is, it, it basically says it's a permissive license which lets anybody do anything with your software, your code base, as long as they provide an attribute back to you. Okay. And it also prevents you, as the software creator, being liable for any problems down the line caused by your code base from anyone else. Okay? That, that's kind of MIT. I'll get into it kind of a bit deeper in a second, but that's an overview. The second biggest one you'll see is the Apache 2.0 license, which is similar to MIT, but also it, it's, a, it's a permissive license, but it also has an express grant of patent rights from the software creator to any sub-users or sub-licensees, and also it protects trademarks. So 
again, I'll, I'll get into this in a second. I was supposed to just breeze over them. I don't want to get in right now. Uh, and this, the, th the third one, the, the third kind of biggest one you'll see is the GPL V2 and V3 license. Um, now, this is what we call a copy left license. Um, I'll get into that in a sec. And again, it's, it's, it's a semi-permissive license, but it allows anyone, to kind of, anyone who um, redistributes your code, they must keep the same licensing terms that you originally put on there. So that's why it says free as in freedom, because what they, what they mean there is the code base, as it goes down through developers and gets redistributed, it must have the same core values that the original software engineer had. Right? Again, I'll, I'll get into this in, in just a second. Um, so the MIT license, the most popular one. What this says to me is I want to keep things simple and permissive. And that's exactly what this license does. Right? So the things it permits, uh, commercial use of the software downloaded and used, distribution, modification, private use, and sub-licensing. It forbids hold liable. So that's what I was saying. You as the software engineer, if you attach this license to your software, anybody who uh, downloads and modifies, redistributes your software can't hold you personally liable for any problems that arise from that. Okay? So this license protects you from that. Um, it's used by you know, a lot of people, it's pointless to point out, but like jQuery, Rails, most, most companies who have like API libraries, they use the MIT based. All of my software is MIT based, so it's used by most people. And again, if you go on GitHub, um, this is the most frequently used license that you're going to find. Um, next up is the, the Apache license. And what this says to me is yes, I want to keep it simple and permissive, but also I care about patents and copyrights, okay? So this is used by slightly bigger companies, such as Apache, SVN, and NuGet, which is the .NET package manager, because they have patents that they have to care for, and they have copyrights in the software that they must look after. Okay? MIT won't protect them with that. It won't protect you from that. If you have patents in your software, if you have copyrights in your software, MIT won't protect you against that. Right? Apache will. So this is the Apache 2.0 license. Again, it permits, I know there's lots of text, I'm sorry. It permits like, very much the same as MIT. Um, it forbids, again, trademark use. People who redistribute your software cannot use your original trademarks in there. So this is what it's protecting you against. Yeah? All right, so this is one of the other most common ones. Um, one thing I will actually touch on on this license, which, which is the same for the next one, is Apache state that for this license to be kind of valid and uh, usable, you must also include a change log in your software. If you, if you want to use this license, you must a, include the license, text file, whatever. You must also have a change log, right? Which is, as an open source kind of advocate, you should have a change log anyway. Any kind of major things that happen to your software, you should always keep a change log. So just make sure you do. Um, and actually, one other thing I will mention is they also recommend, because it's Apache and they want to be a bit more anal about it, that you have a header in, in, in every single source file with that. Yeah, has anyone seen it? People's source code that's got the license in every single file? Yeah. Apache recommend you do that. It's not necessarily 100% kind of legal. You must do that as long as you've got the license text file in the source directory. But they recommend you do that as well. Okay. Um, and the third license that I touched on was the GPL license. Again, what this license says to me, it's not about kind of keeping things permissive or copyrights. This is about wanting to share improvements, right? And what I mean by that is, how, what I said at the beginning, the, the, the kind of license must remain the same from wh whoever kind of has the software, you know, six modifications down the line, or the original company who put it out. One good example of this is WordPress, right? So what WordPress mean by this is because WordPress was like free, and they license it as free, nobody can modify WordPress and then sell it, okay? It would be illegal to do so. Now, you can buy hosted WordPress. You can buy WordPress kind of software as a service. That's different, right? That's like a services provider. But you can't have a WordPress code base that's been modified and pay for it because that's illegal, because this is what this license stands for. And this is used by companies, like I say, like Linux, Git, WordPress, because they believe whatever happens to their software, whichever engineers come and modify it and share it, they can't charge for it if the original person didn't charge for it. Right? So the license terms must stay the same. Does that make sense? Wicked. Um, again, uh, one thing to touch on with this is you must keep a change log for any significant changes that happen. 
uh, but we should be doing that anyway, so yeah. So I've kind of, I've gone over, albeit in a nice fast 10 minutes, just what we like, the kind of the what of open source, what it is and what the licensing in includes. So now this whole talk is to get you kind of excited about getting involved in open source. So now I want to talk about the why, right? So we've talked about the, wha the what, let's talk about the whys of open source, all right? Um, so the biggest one, oh God, there's bullet points in this. Hang on, just let me get through that. There you go, right. So the biggest question <coughs> I get, well, actually, no, this is the second biggest question. I'll get on to the, to the biggest one. The second biggest question I get is why should I contribute to open source? As a developer, why should I spend my time contributing to open source project? Why should I open source my own software? Why should I get involved with the community? Uh, the biggest point and the biggest answer to this I can make is to make a world of better software, right? This is what I was saying by opening up the contributor pool on any given piece of software is a want to make better software, all right? It's a community of people coming together to make better software, okay? Be it their own project, be it somebody else's project, you know, it could be R-spec testing for Ruby, it could be even Ruby's core, it could be Rails core. Getting, in, getting involved, if you have answers to problems they don't have, getting involved and, you know, shipping code with them, it's, it's to, to make better software, right? Uh, to share knowledge uh, amongst fellow developers, one of the biggest and kind of most important parts of my life is sharing knowledge. I love teaching, be that by giving talks, be that by mentoring startups, be that by teaching at code schools, writing technical articles, tutorials, whatever. I love teaching, right? And one of the biggest kind of most rewarding parts of open source is that every time you ship a bit of code, one developer at least might learn from it, okay? They might look at that code and think, I had that problem. Then they look at your code, they see how you did it, and they learn from it. You're teaching. Right? It couldn't be simpler and it couldn't be more rewarding. Uh, to help a project reach its goals, this has been a personal kind of reasoning for me a lot of the time. I find like half finished projects that I, I need to use this in my code, but it's not quite finished. So let me help them finish this project so I can use it in my code. Again, A, rewarding and B, useful, right? Uh, to sharpen your skills. Again, while I was saying teaching is one of the most important parts, learning. Right? You, can, you might see by contributing to uh, an open source project, you might submit a pull request that you think is great, and then the owner of that repo can politely tell you, no, it's not good enough. Right? But then they might guide you through why it's not good enough. They can help you refactor your own code, which teaches you yourself how to write that code better. Okay? So you're learning. Another very, very important thing. Um, and the biggest thing that I want to drive home today is to join a community. To join a community of like-minded developers working on similar projects in the same languages, maybe with the same skill set, some with many more advanced skill sets who are the people you learn from. It's great, right? The community of developers is the most important thing in the kind of software world. I genuinely believe that. Um, so there's some of the reasons why you should contribute to open source, okay? Um, and if not, if you don't believe me, if you think I'm talking shit and, and you don't believe any of these reasons, at least contribute so you can try and make awesome pictures on your GitHub commit history. So if you don't want to go with any of those reasons, at least just try and set it up so you can do commits like this. I don't know who did this, but they are geniuses, whoever they were. If it's not Photoshop, I hope it's not. Um, anyway, that's a, a bit of a joke. But uh, So you've seen kind of why why should you contribute to open source? Um, but why should you open source your own software? You've got a project, it's a personal project. Um, I don't know, it could be like a really, really cool drum machine you've built in JavaScript and Ruby, uh, and you've got it hosted somewhere, but you don't want to share the source code. Why? I honestly can't believe anybody when they say like, they, you know, they really don't believe, you know, they don't want anybody to copy it or something like that, it's, it's bullshit, right? So why, why should you open source your software? Now, obviously, we can't open source every single piece of software we ever write. Some might have core logic for our companies that we can't open source. I'll get into that later on, but for the, for the most part, we should open source almost everything we can, right? So why? Again, as I was saying on the last slide, to share knowledge. If you find a project that's having some troubles, or you find a bug in a project, and you have the answer to that, by going on, by getting involved with that community, 
by reaching out to the developers who are working on that, you can teach them, okay? If you patch a bug, the owner of the project didn't know how to patch, the owner of the project's going to learn from that, right? You're teaching. It's, it's fantastic, right? To gain knowledge, again, to learn. You could go, like I say, you could have a project of your own that someone spots a bug in that you didn't spot before. You're going to learn from that. When they submit a pull request and say, this is a bug, this is how I patched it, you can learn from that. Again, that's very, very important. To create a community around your project, again, biggest thing I'm going to drive home all day here is community. Um, this is an interesting one. So to potentially save money, this is one. Uh, this is a point that kind of got it got pointed out to me a couple, like a few months ago. Um, that there are some companies now who are kind of allowing open source uh, developers to to people who are very involved in open source, etc., to come in and you know kind of build their own build their own features into this company's software or whatever. And that the company is claiming that by doing that, they're actually saving money because the, the open source community is building features for a product that the paid developers would be building. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about this point. Uh, for me, it's kind of it's playing one type of developer off against the other. I'm not really bothered about it. But again, you could potentially save money by opening up the contributor pool to help other people. You know, other people can come fix your bugs for you so you don't have to pay to get it done, whatever. Um, and to speed up the pace of software development. So, I mean, I can ask you the question, if you have four developers in your team, if you open source your product to 14 community members, who's going to get the work done faster? How is the software going to turn around faster? Who's going to spot bugs quicker? It's going to be the bigger group of developers, right? So you can speed up pace of software development by open sourcing your software to the community, getting more people, more developers to come and help you build your software, right? So we're speeding up the pace of our software development. Yeah? OK. Um, so the, the, the talk kind of title is, is, is the value of open source. Um, so I want to talk about the actual kind of the, the values lying inside open source uh, from a kind of an actual literal valuable term. Um, so does the, does the value of open source lie in the code itself? Uh, or does it lie in? what I'm going to talk about next, but we'll see. So the value of code, obviously, code is freely accessible. And it's, as I said a couple of slides ago, it's a prominent focus um, in our open source world, right? The, our source code is what we are open sourcing, right? This is, this is what's kind of valuable in a project. It's the source code itself, right? Um, we can quantify code if we open source it. Tools like GitHub allow us to see who contributes to our software, how much time they spend on our software, what they've done in our software, how good they are, or how, you know, how good the code that they've produced is. So we can actually quantify on a per contributor basis the value that lies inside any kind of one project. Right? Like I say, GitHub allows you to, to do this like, just off the shelf. There are also add-ons for GitHub you can get that do this better, and Bitbucket, et cetera, does it. Um, and the other thing that's kind of valuable in code itself is that in open source world, code is fickle, but in a good way. Our code changes a lot in our open source world. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? If we open up our contributor pool to more developers, we can change our software faster, OK? We can fix bugs quicker. We can find problems quicker, right? And we can produce software faster, OK? So who thinks the value as a literal kind of term, the value of open source lies in code itself. Yeah? Who thinks the value of open source lies in the community? Who thinks it depends? It depends. Always wait for it depends, right? It totally depends. It's a split of both. Code is very valuable, but the community is also equally valuable, right? So the value that lies in our communities around our open source. So as I say, we have a community surrounding a shared set of goals, right? This is people who contribute to a project. They contribute to it for a reason. They want that project to improve, right? Everybody who's contributing to that project, or hopefully everybody, has a, the same goal, right? They want that piece of software to be awesome. So they're sharing their knowledge. Their friends are sharing their knowledge. The other developers in the community are sharing their knowledge, 
right? And this is incredibly valuable, right? And again, well, the knowledge being shared is invaluable. That's, that's absolutely true. I've learned more from being involved in open source software than I ever have teaching myself bits of software. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's absolutely invaluable. The fact that kind of you can have any level of developer, and there's no exclusion here, right? In an open source world, there's no exclusions. We can't say that this project can only be contributed to by amazing developers. We don't do that, and we shouldn't do that. And anybody who does, we should find them and slap them, right? Because that's just, that's just stupid, right? We don't do that. There's no exclusion here. The people who maybe aren't as knowledgeable learn a lot from the people who are knowledgeable, right? And this is incredibly important. Uh, and again, with, with more than one pair of eyes, we're much more likely to patch bugs. Okay, so that's valuable in itself, right? We're fixing, we're fixing bugs, we're fixing, fixing errors in our software, you know, much, much quicker because we've opened up the contributor pool to maybe 50 developers instead of our core five or our core one, right? So we can fix bugs a lot quicker and that's incredibly valuable too. The biggest value in a lot of ways lies in the relationships um, between not so much the product owners, but the people who are involved with the project and the community members, right? Um, and this is, this is a really, really big point. I will kind of drive home a little bit later, but relationships matter, right? Relationships are like the most important things ever, right? Um, if you can make relationships, good relationships, with the developers who are contributing to your project, they're gonna wanna contribute more. They're gonna wanna work harder because it's rewarding, Right, and I'll get into that actually uh, a little bit later, kind of the rewards that come alongside open sourcing and stuff. Um, so arguably the community based around a project is the most valuable part of that project, okay? As well as the project itself. I think it's an equal split. Sometimes the code is the most important part. Sometimes a project doesn't have much community around it. But any good project that's open source and you know, sort of encourages contributors, the community around that is arguably the most important part of that software, right? Um, so again, inclusiveness. Everybody can contribute to our software. There's no exclusion here. Doesn't matter whether they're a beginner software developer or they've been engineering for 20 years. Everybody can contribute to our software, right? And it's incredibly rewarding for us when they do. And it's incredibly rewarding for them when we say, when we merge a pull request of theirs, yeah? Transparency. Now, this is quite an important one. Um, basically, kind of, we, if we open source our software, all of the decisions that get made for that software are public. We can see where a project's going, and everybody can see where that project's going, right? They can look in the change log and see that this changed and that changed. Hopefully, you guys, if you're going to open source software and you have a big project, you'll have a roadmap as well that the community can get involved, even if it's just something as simple as a Google Doc that the community can get in and add things to uh, you know, a potential roadmap or ideas. Transparency and showing the community where the project is going is, the most, is one of the most important things. There's been like quite a few uh, big projects that people have just, like the owners have just pulled and dropped with no warning, okay? And the, the, the entire project's just gone. And then it's left to the community to pick up the pieces. I don't like this. If you have a, a huge piece of software that's you know, open source, it's a big Ruby gem or whatever that you just can't manage anymore, hand it off to your community gracefully, right? Email out to your biggest contributors and say, hey, I'm too busy now or I've got a new job. I need to step back from this gem. Can you take over? You know, reach out to your contributors and allow that to happen. But yeah, so the, the main point here being transparency is super important. We should always be able to see where a piece of software is going what features are coming next, what features are going to be deprecated is even more important, if they are. We should always be able to see this, okay? And equality. Everybody in an open source project should be equal. There should be no owners of parts of the project. There should be no more senior people in the project or more junior people. Um, there shouldn't be any kind of reserved privileges or rights for anybody uh, in the open source world, yeah? Uh, I'll get into that as well, like uh, in, in the open source kind of horrors thing I'll talk about later. Um, but yeah, so this is the kind of the big value in open source to me is the community, all right, for the, for the reasons that I've just said. Um, so I've kind of talked about the community base around it, the code itself, some of the licensing. 
I want to talk just quickly about some of the tools. I mean, considering most of you are already open sourcing this, you'll, you already know about most of them anyway. So it might be uh, ironic. Point. Actually, you know what? I want to drive that home for a point there. Um, so who uses GitHub already? Pretty much everybody uses GitHub. All right, aw awesome. So everybody knows what it is. Um, which, which is fantastic. The, the reason that I wanted to show this, because everybody knows what it is, is, is this. Building, better, building software better together, right? Encouraging people to work on projects together, encouraging people to contribute to projects is absolutely invaluable. Um, and I love the fact that you know, GitHub are all about that, and obviously because that's what they do. Um, but yeah, code sharing is, is mega important. Um, and we use, well, SendGrid uses GitHub for pr practically everything. Um, I use GitHub for practically everything. Um, GitHub is, with it being the most important kind of code sharing over Bitbucket slightly, uh, people would argue that this is the best way to get involved with open source is to look at GitHub. Um, there's actually uh, a, new, a new website app that a, a friend of mine actually just launched called libraries.io, um, which is like a huge kind of correlation of all open source libraries on GitHub and what they're written in and how to contribute to them and things like that. Um, so that's a really cool way to find out about open source things. From a, excuse me, from a developer point of view, if you want to find out about new projects and you want to use them, just look at GitHub, do a search. You know, we can get it that way. Um, second to GitHub is Bitbucket. Again, it's the same principle, uh, open source code management for anyone who doesn't know. The one thing that people like about Bitbucket kind of more than GitHub is, well, GitHub went down today for anyone, uh, I don't know if anybody noticed, if anybody noticed this, yeah. Some of my dependencies broke trying to do a build earlier because GitHub actually got DDoS today, so they were down for a couple of hours. So maybe one thing that Bitbucket has over that is that Bitbucket was up all day today. Um, but <laughs> no, I'm, that's just a dig, I'm only kidding. Um, but also Bitbucket allows for private repos for free of charge. So if you need private repos that you want to contribute with just your friend, Bitbucket can help you out there. Um, but yeah, so there's code management and of course there's project management too because like anything, like any piece of software we have, be it in the business world, be it in the personal world, we need to be able to manage projects the same as we would at work or in a, in a personal life. So for instance, when we need to track issues, we need to have milestones and we need roadmaps. We can use things like Open Project and Redmine. Yeah, these are the two biggest ones. Anyone heard of either of those? They're kind of a little bit old school, both of these, in the sense that I think someone's waiting for people to come along and build a much nicer kind of UI version of both of these. But as far as I know, there isn't a leader in the market yet. So if anyone wants to build that, there's your startup idea for free, open source project management. There you go, there's a free startup idea for the day. Um, and again, having an internal wiki for a project is always a good idea. The same way we do at SendGrid for all of our core systems, the same way I have to talk to all of our engineers in California, in Denver, we need to have conversations before we change things. It's the same in the open source world. And this links back to the transparency that I was talking about last slide. If we have an internal wiki or a kind of project roadmap that the public can see and our community can contribute to, we should have that, OK? Um, so what I want to talk next about is really driving home some of the big names who are now embracing open source. Obviously, one of the most recent wins is like Microsoft open sourcing.net, which is pretty crazy. Like that's a huge win for the, the Windows community. Um, I mean, me personally, I'm not a .NET developer, but it's still amazing that they've done that. Uh, but some of the bigger names, like uh, this is too long. I'm sorry, there's animations. I hate animations. So, right. So Google, uh, obviously Google built the Go programming language all open source, and Google have kind of hundreds of open source projects. They, op they recently open sourced their build tool. Um, I can't remember what it's called, uh, but it's like, yeah, it's a build tool for your projects. Uh, they just recently open sourced that too. Um, SendGrid, all of our API libraries, our documentation as well as open source. I'll get into that as one of the open source wins, because that's actually a great idea for like everybody else. GitHub, based around open source. SoundCloud, SoundCloud have dozens of open source repos, a lot of them written in Go, which is awesome. They have like Clojure, they have Python, they have PHP, they have lots. Um, Twilio, they have all their API libraries, they're all open source, people can come on, contribute them, fix them. The reason I wanted to put Mongo and Couchbase up there is because their entire core system, well Couchbase at least, their entire core system is open source. 
but they're still like a multi-million dollar business and they're an enterprise product. And a lot of people don't understand how that works. How can something be open source but still make millions of dollars? Because surely everybody would just download the source, build it themselves and run it themselves, right? Not necessarily. I'll get into that a bit later though. But I wanted to point out that their entire core system is open source, which is really cool. And Docker, everyone heard of, everybody's heard of it. Like when I first put this, like, like I first gave this talk like last year, and at the time Docker was really small, no one had really heard about it, but everybody's heard of Docker now. Um, anybody who hasn't, it's like a containerized uh, VM environment for your laptop. But, uh, but that's fully open source. And again, it's written in Go, which is an open source language, so even cooler, right? Um, so what I wanted to talk about there when I touched on Couchbase is the open source pricing model, right? And the biggest point I can make is that because our software is open source, because our code base is freely available, it doesn't necessarily mean we can't make money from it, right? It doesn't mean we can't have any revenue, okay? And the way we do this is by choosing our licensing correctly and positioning, our, positioning ourselves correctly, okay? The same way Couchbase have and the same way Mongo have, right? So, due licensing. So, what I mean by due licensing is Couchbase, I'm going to use them as an example because they're just the easiest one to use, right? Their entire code base is available on GitHub, but they still make multi-millions of dollars a year, right? Because they have an enterprise version and a community version. But even then, it doesn't matter which version because the code base is still available on GitHub. So why would anybody pay for it? Surely we'd all just go on GitHub, clone the repo, build it locally, and run our own instances of it. Wouldn't we do that? Yes? No? No? Yes, potentially, right? But when you've got something as complex as a huge scalable database backend, you're probably going to need support at some point, right? This is how Couchbase ma makes its money. This is its dual licensing model, right? What they've done is, although all of their kind of their code base, their entire core system, although it's available and it's licensed, I'm not sure which license they use, probably Apache, I would thought, but I'm not sure, I haven't checked. Um, you can, yes, you can download their code base, you can contribute to their code base, but they're not, they're not necessarily charging for that. They're charging more for the service, all right? So for instance, in their enterprise version, you kind of pay per the amount of nodes you have in a database cluster, right? You pay for support, you pay for installation engineering, support engineering, that kind of thing, all right? So even though their code base is available online, and some developers are like, yeah, sure, I can download that, build it locally and run it locally, that's cool, I don't need to pay them. This is more kind of when you get to bigger enterprise level who they don't have time to kind of put hundreds of developers in to install it, they need Couchbase to come along uh, with you know, their support engineers, help them install it, give them support, and that's how they make the money. So this is dual licensing, all right? You've got a license in your open source software repo, be it on GitHub, Bitbucket, whatever, but you're also licensing the product as a software as a service, or a platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service, whatever it's going to be, all right? So the big point here is, although our software is open source, that doesn't mean we can't make revenue from it, okay? Now, as I did say, we can't open source everything. This, doesn't, this, this licensing model doesn't work for everyone. I'm not saying go away and open source your code base now, because you might give away a lot of business secrets you don't want to, right? And it's the same for us. At SendGrid, a lot of our core logic, we can't give that away. We can't, right? But what we can do is try and open source everything else that we can. Our API libraries, things like runners, things like workers, worker processes, distribution queues, anything like that that we write that we can find useful in our software, someone else might find it useful. So we open source that, right? So like I said, even though we can't open source everything, Couchbase can, it works for them, it doesn't work for everyone, right? So we do have to be mindful about what we open source, but as a general rule, we can pretty much open source everything, bar our core logic, yeah? Um, revenue streams from additional product services, ongoing professional services, things like support, things like sales engineers, uh, offering the software as a service, as I say, and one that's kind of not, uh, obviously not very common in the software world is like selling of branded merchandise. But again, it's an idea, it's kind of the idea that we can still have revenue from software that's open source, okay? But this isn't to say that you should be charging for a gem that helps people, uh, I don't know, like build into our spec or anything like that. Like you shouldn't charge for these things just because you can. This is more from a business point of view, if you've got like a big company and you have core logic, can you open source it? 
you know, you've got to ask the question, can we open source it? No, okay, let's open source everything else we can. Can we open source it? Yes, okay, let's think about which pricing structure we need to use. Let's think about the licensing we need to use. Let's think how we do it, you know, smartly, yeah? All right, so again, this whole talk kind of, it, it's a lot of it is going to be things that you already know, right? It's open source. If everyone's involved in it, you kind of already know. But the, the idea of this is to get people excited about open source and hopefully for anyone who isn't, you know, utilizing open source to get involved and go away and do so, all right? So I want to talk about getting involved. Um, how you as a developer can get involved, as a project manager can get involved, or anything else like that, right? And there are more ways to do so than just, I don't know, contributing to a GitHub repo, submitting a pull request. There's a lot more ways to get involved in open source than that, okay? Uh, the first one and the most obvious one is code, right? How can we get involved in open source? Contribute to code, contribute to people's uh, software, right? Find repos that you are, find, well, I'm, t I'm talking, you know, GitHub there. Find a GitHub repo that you're interested in and contribute to it. Have a look at some of the pull requests in there. See what other people are spotting. If you find a bug, this is especially, if you find a bug in someone else's software, actually, I'm going to ask this as a question. How many people have found bugs in other people's software? All right, how many people have then gone on to fix that bug for them? That's good. Now, this is what I want to see everybody with their hands up there. That's the thing. We should all be doing this, right? So I use, like, I, um, I give a talk about dependencies. I kind of don't like dependencies, but as a Ruby developer, I use gems, and they bundle a shitload of dependencies. I don't like that. Um, but anyway, if I find that I'm getting a stupid error um, that from someone else's library, obviously not stupid, it could be my problem, whatever, but if I find an error in someone else's library, I then want to fix that, all right? And this is what I was saying earlier about unfinished projects as well. If I find a project that's unfinished, but I want to use it, I'm going to, try, I'm going to give away a few hours of my time to help finish that project so I can use it, all right? So it's kind of being selfish in a way, it's because I want that project, but at the same time, we know that it's not selfish and it's an incredibly good thing to do in a community because a thousand other people can use that project too, right? Um, so, yeah, getting involved, so open sourcing your own repos, letting people contribute to your code and contributing to other people's code, very, very important. This is how we can get involved. But there are other ways to get involved other than like big code bases. We can make little gists on GitHub, so just single line, single little bits of script. So, I don't know, you might write a tiny, like a few lines of Go that might, uh, I don't know, it could just be like a little daemon process or something like that. Anyway, you could share that. You should share like everything and say, hey, I made a little script that does this, or I made a little script that does that, right? So it doesn't need to be a big gem or a big library or a big package. It doesn't need to be kind of any of these things. It can be just a few lines of code that someone might find useful, right? Actually, one of my most popular gists on GitHub was a really, really silly. Basically, it was a CSV generator that generated, it was kind of, you could toggle how many kind of rows it had and what it did, but it was just like a contact database generator for CSV. It was like 14 lines of Ruby, something like that, if that, and that was one of my most popular gists, right? People love this kind of thing. Little tiny scripts that might help, that might help them in their daily, you know, day-to-day -day running of their business or day-to-day -day bits of code, okay? So this is other ways we can get involved. Um, but as well as writing code and open sourcing our own code, we can get involved on things like Stack Overflow. We can answer questions people have on Stack Overflow relating to projects that we're working on. We can answer questions on Stack Overflow that have nothing to do with us, but we still want to answer them just because we have the knowledge, right? And again, this is kind of one of the kind of community bits of open source that I really do believe in. Um, so yeah, we can get involved like that. Uh, so that's code the most obvious way to get involved with open source. Everybody knows, right? But there are other ways of getting involved that are almost equally as important. My favorite, next to code, technical writing, right? I absolutely love writing tutorials. I love writing blogs about a piece of software that I've just built, right? Anything like that. So for instance, let's take tutorials, right? So. Let's just say you've got an open source repo. Again, I'm using like gems and things as examples because I'm a Ruby guy, but let's say you've just built a new Ruby gem. It could be an, it could be an auth gem that helps, you know, it could hook in with device for Rails or whatever. Why don't you write about that? Okay, you've just built this. You've put it on GitHub. Nobody knows it's on GitHub. You might tweet about it. People might find it on GitHub, but why not drive traffic to that? 
why not open up the contributor pool? And more importantly, why not teach people how you did it by writing a blog? A simple tutorial. And it doesn't have to be like mine, which are like stupidly 2,000 words because I write a lot, because I talk a lot, because that's me. But like, it doesn't have to be like that. It, sh it could be short. It should be short, right? It can be to the point. It can just be, this is how I did this. Here's some code. This is how I did this. Here's some code. Here's the project. Yeah? So technical tutorials, blogs, that kind of thing, are another way we can easily get involved with open source software without that much effort, realistically. It could take an hour, if that, right? Totally worth it. Um, and again, by using technical writing kind of from a, from a more project perspective, if you have a project that you want to drive signups for or whatever, if you have technical tutorials on your documentation side of the website, that, that could drive traffic to signups, right? Which leads me on to my next point, which is if you have a project, don't write blogs that are related to that project. Right? This is, one of the, this is one of the things I find, like, people from some companies, um, they only write blogs or tutorials that relate to that company. And it's bad. Like, how to use this product in Python, how to use this product in Ruby, that it's, that's shit. Right? Don't do that. What you should be doing is thinking about what you learned recently or a cool piece of technology that you've just been doing and publish it on the company's blog part of the website, right? Because that drives traffic. It drives traffic to the company themselves or whatever, right? But more importantly, from an open source point of view, I like kind of blogs that have a huge range of topics that aren't like conceded to a couple of topics. So this would drive me to like a piece of open source software a lot more if I know that the people around that kind of have a much kind of bigger range of knowledge, right? Or they have a really cool blog feed that I can subscribe to that's got awesome topics that aren't only related to the open source project itself, all right? So again, write things that you want to write about, not necessarily related to your project. The project could be in Ruby. You might write a blog about Go or a, a, a blog about Erlang or Elixir, something cool like that. So that's fine, right? So technical writing, again, it's my favorite way of getting involved, uh, and it's one of the biggest ones that you can like drive traffic to your project, get contributors on your project, et cetera, right? And the next one is community events. Uh, as a developer evangelist, I go to a lot of events. I've gone to like hundreds and hundreds of events over the last couple of years. That could be things like this, conferences, et cetera. But as the owner of an open source project, what you want to do is get out into your community and talk to like-minded developers, right? And if you're influential, if you, if you have like a big open source project that's taken off recently that people are like, wow, that tech's amazing, apply to speak at conferences about that topic. Apply to speak at meetups about that topic. If you have a really cool bit piece of open source software that everybody's like kind of screaming about at the minute, everybody loves it, go and give a talk about that. I guarantee you'll get an audience, right? But more than that, if you don't want to give a talk, if you, I don't know, say for me, for instance, go along to your local Ruby meetup chat to other Ruby developers, go along to your local PHP, Java, .NET, whatever, find a meetup, go to it, and talk to people, okay? And you don't need to go there and say, I'm working on this, hi, you should check this out. Don't be like that, right? Just be, hi, what are you working on? This is like my favorite thing to ask developers, what are you working on, what are you building, right? Get an, in get an interest. And this is what I was saying about relationships, right? The community based around your project are gonna have a much better relationship with you if you are just a good human being about things, yeah? So, and you can do this, like I say, by going along to meetups, conferences, drinkabouts. Like, you don't even have to go to like a, a normal meetup. There's drinkabouts now where everybody basically just goes to the pub on a Friday, gets drunk and talks about tech. You can do that, right? You can build a community that way, okay? And this is one of the best ways of building com a community, events, yeah? Cool. So, I haven't got that long left, but I've got a little bit of time. Um, I've talked about all the best things in open source, how great it is, how amazing it is, and how I've had a great time with it. But like everything in life, it does have to have its problems, right? Not everything in open source can be perfect. And there are problems, right? And they are very avoidable problems most of the time as well. But you're gonna, and you'll probably nod your head when I read a couple of these out, all right? So the biggest open source horrors, sensitive information left in public repos, all right? So we've just, we've been working on our project. We've pushed it up to GitHub 
and we've forgotten to take some of our private keys out of it. How about that? Anyone done that? I have. I'll have hold my hand up. I've done that many times. Um, now, the way I want to drive this one home, particularly, is a story that one of the guys, when I last gave this talk, a guy in the front row stood up and he talked to me about leaving sensitive information. And what he said to me was quite amazing, right? He left some AWS environment keys inside his piece of software. He then got frauded for $15,000 worth of AWS, and AWS wouldn't refund him because it was his fault. All right? No, I'm not shouting at AWS, that's right, right? But at the same time, this is a horror story, right? We need to make sure we don't do this, okay? So it's one of the most easily avoidable but most common problems that we have, leaving sensitive information in our repos, Git pushing them without thinking, and then those being available for nasty people to go scrape through our repos, get all of our sensitive information and abuse it, yeah? So this is something we need to be mindful of. If you're going to use APIs, make sure you don't put any API keys in there. Use environment variables, that kind of thing, to avoid it. It's, it's simple, but we need to make sure that we're doing it. All right? Sensitive information trusted to the wrong people. This is slightly less common, but it's still something I need to touch on. Um, so say you have a project that, I don't know, it's got... A th I don't know, like 50 servers or something on AWS that you, you don't want to manage, so you hand that off to someone else to help manage. You then fall out with that person, you have an argument with them, and they go and wipe everything from AWS or something like that, right? This isn't something that I can kind of tell you how to avoid, it's just common sense, right? Just be, be, be wise about any sensitive information that you need to trust to your community. The community, hopefully, as I, have, as I will say, are the best people, right? but you might get one or two who aren't good members of the community and just want to do something bad, all right? So make sure you don't trust incredibly sensitive information to the wrong people. It's just common sense, this one. And this kind of goes hand in hand as well with allowing anybody to own parts of your software. What I was saying earlier about everybody should be equal, people shouldn't own different parts of software. This happens more at companies than in open source, but it does happen in open source too. If you've got like some kind of, I don't know, wizard who's like working away on his code, and nobody else knows how his code works, but he does. It's bad because we shouldn't let that happen as a business or in open source. We should never let that happen. But if it does happen and that person then leaves, everybody else in the project is just like, oh, I don't know how his code works. I don't know how to fix his code. There's a problem. I don't know what to do. All right? So this is something that we need to make sure that we manage. And again, we can do this through transparency making sure that we know what everybody in the community is doing, what everybody in the project's doing. If we can make sure we can manage that, then we won't have this problem. If anybody leaves at any moment, it'll be a big shame, but the project's not going to fall on its back. Yeah? So again, these are big, just big problems that are easily avoidable. Easily avoidable. Um, but I always learn to kind of never get towards the end of anything on a, on a bad note. All right, so I want to talk about a success story with open source. And that's actually us, um, or I say, I wasn't even there at the time. This is, this is Sengrid. Oh, actually, I was. Um, so this is an interesting one. Not many people do this, but this is something that I would kind of like a lot of people to go away and try, which is open sourcing your documentation. Your API docs should be open source. And I want to tell you why, right? So almost a year ago, we open sourced our docs our documentation, and it was a huge success. So how did we do that? Well, we, uh, so our documentation, I don't know what you guys use for docs, everybody uses something different. We just use a Ruby static site generator, okay? But the source code for all of those, all of those pages, the markdown pages, are available on GitHub. What that meant was anybody in our community who spots mistakes, it could be a code mistake, it could be a URL variable mistake, or anything like that, it could be even a spelling mistake. Anyone from the community could go onto our docs, click edit on the page, and they would be taken to GitHub and they could submit a pull request to our docs. So the community are getting involved in our documentation, right? Hugely successful. So stats from the year of doing this, um, we got 59 new contributors to our documentation, 15 of which were kind of avid community members, and we had a 30 times growth in the amount of kind of contributions to our documentation in one year, right? So our docs, can we say 30 times better 
Yeah, actually, because our docks a year ago were pretty shoddy, and now they're very, very, very good. All right? And they're getting better all the time. Okay? So this is like a really big, interesting one. Not many people think of doing this. It's a relatively new concept. Open sourcing your API documentation is, is it's, it's just going to be a successful stop, right? One of the reasons I like the fact we did this, and actually this has happened, this is, this has happened I think, six times now. We've had people come up to us and say that because we did it, they did it, all right? So the code ship guys said, the SendGrid docs helped tremendously developing our new code ship docs. Thanks. And they wrote a blog about us. It's nice. Everybody likes to be appreciated. And we like this a lot, right? The last time I gave this talk, it was in Paris. And one of the guys in the audience tweeted me a week later to say, hey, Robin, look, we've just open sourced our docs. Thanks for your talk, right? I kind of want to see that from here. I want to see everybody open sourcing their docs. Not for my benefit, for your benefit. Your documentation is just going to get better and better because it's not limited to one team anymore. It's out in the community. Everybody can contribute to it. Everybody can help fix it. Everybody can make it better. Okay? So again, open sourcing docs, totally something that not many people think about, but it really is one of the most tremendous ways of getting involved in open source for your project. Yeah? All right. So if you're going to go away and you're going to open source things, you're going to open source your own software, I'd like to help you get contributors to that software. And the biggest points that I can kind of think of, use GitHub. People like Bitbucket, but more people like GitHub, right? And it's, I know like, I'm, not, I'm not being like favoritism or anything like that. That's just how it is. Most people want to use GitHub. Developers want to use GitHub. So if you have a project, you want to open source it, a good way to go is safely assume GitHub. Yeah? Uh, build the project modularly. Now, what I mean by that is build, like everybody, like this is a big thing at the minute. Everyone's talking about like service oriented architecture, like microservices. You should do this in open source too. Okay? If you have an open source project that has different parts to it, it could have, I don't know, like an operator daemon that does something daily, it could have an auth system. Uh, it could have a process manager. It could have a heartbeat monitor written in Erlang. All these different parts. If you build them as different GitHub repos and you put them all up, it's going to attract more developers. Because you might have an Erlang developer interested in your heartbeat monitor who doesn't care about your Rails off bit. Right? They don't care about that repo. They just want the heartbeat monitor. So by opening this up, by splitting it down into smaller projects, you can get many more developers from many different backgrounds to come in because they only want specific parts of your software. All right? And it's not that difficult to do. Okay? It can be difficult to do if you've already got a project, which is like a big behemoth. You can't really split that down. Don't worry about it. Try and keep it in mind for the future. But again, splitting, systems, splitting things down into different parts means you'll get developers who are interested in that part Instead of having to you know, go through a huge repo that contains everything and pull out the bits they need, they've got these sim single repos for all the different modules that they need. Yeah? So this is one way we should be thinking about doing this. Um, gathering metrics on your contributors and using them also links into rewarding your contributors. The open source community, they don't do it for rewards. I don't do it for rewards. I hope you guys don't do it for rewards. I don't do it for recognition. I do it for the want of better software. Right. But it's nice to get recognized, right? At SendGrid, we have little badges. They're just like little Velcro badges that we send out to everybody who contributes to our GitHub repos. Everybody. And it costs nothing, right? Well, it barely costs anything. It's not even worth thinking about, right? You can't do that, right? You, you might not have time to, send, to mail out badges or anything like that. An email, a tweet, anything like that. If someone submits a pull request, acknowledge them, talk to them, OK? It's super important. Right? I see like way too many repos that have like owners who are like super up their own ass and they just won't talk to the community. They don't acknowledge the community and they don't reward them. And then that project dies because nobody wants to contribute to that project anymore. That's not how it should be, right? So if you have contributors, reward them. This could be a t shirt, right? Obviously, we can't all afford to send out hundreds of t shirts from out of big projects. But like I say, an email. Just a thank you, a tweet, it takes two seconds. All right? We should be rewarding our contributors. We should be acknowledging them. 
And again, this goes hand in hand with looking after our contributors. Make sure that your contributors feel that they are contributing to a project and a community worth contributing to, and that they want to continue contributing to, okay? We should keep it friendly, we should keep it transparent, we should keep it equal, and everybody should feel like they are a good part of that project. And this is how we're going to get more contributors, right? And the good way to build this is when you only have a couple of contributors, make sure you start up a conversation with them. Make sure you say, hey, thanks for this pull request. You know, and then talk to them about it. Say why, S say, yeah, it's cool, that's awesome, thank you, whatever, right? And yeah, again, I've just mentioned this, but talking to your contributors, so important, right? It only takes two seconds to send a tweet to someone. You, you know, you, even if it's in the GitHub repo, you can say thanks in a pull request. You have comments available. Don't merge a pull request and then just leave it. Or don't deny a pull request. That's even worse. Do not like, deny a pull request merge and then just leave it and say nothing. Because that person's not going to learn. The community member is going to be like, oh, wow, why? He didn't merge it. And then they're going to feel bad. And it's going to drive people away from your project as opposed to, to it. Right? Make sure we talk to our contributors. Yeah? Um, and then that, that's, that's it. Uh, I've only got five minutes left, so I'll go into questions. But I hope that everybody will go forth and open source, whether it being your own project, getting involved in other people's projects, using the tools I said, using the techniques I said, writing blogs, contributing to code, going to events, anything like that. Get involved in your open source community, okay? Because it will lead to better software for everybody, right? If anyone has any questions, I'm at RBIN on Twitter. At Robin, you know, Robin at Senga.com if you want to email me, whatever. I'll be here around anyway. So, but yeah, thank you guys. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs> questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you talked about dual licensing yes. in uh, open source. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's uh, quite a diff uh, few different approaches. Uh, do you, uh, can you share with us your, your thought on uh, companies such as? Uh, uh, Sugar CRM uh, that uh, open source a crappy version that has no bug fixes, or uh, Lightray that open sources a version that is a year and a half behind. Uh -huh. and, okay. Uh, no bug fixes, or iSpaces that uh, open sources uh, only the latest major mm -hmm. version without all the, the minor updates, without right. hundreds of bug fixes. And uh, uh, those that open source, the, uh, which I find really totally deadly. Uh, those companies that open source their software and then uh, close source their documentation. Yes. So okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, All right. So it's a good point, well made. Um, so the the unfortunately, there's nothing I can say to these companies that's going to get them to change what they've done. Right. All I can do is they're try and. Money. Yeah. So they're somewhat successful. So right. Again, with the dual licensing, it's always it's always a touchy subject. Not every, it doesn't work for everybody, right? I like the way Couchbase do it. They don't only put one like unfixed version on GitHub. They open source their code base for up to the latest build, right? But then they rely on licensing for software as a service, etc. Like you said, companies who are kind of open sourcing a version that's like 10 fixes behind or even a minor version bump behind, whatever, and then charging for like, the better version, that's not a good way to do it, really. I would definitely not do it like that. Um, but unfortunately, then you know, I, I can't speak for everyone. The best, honestly, the best, the best kind of way I can look at this is the likes of Couchbase. They do it properly. They have the due licensing model down to a T, I think, personally. Um, that's the best example I can give. Yeah. Unless you're a bank, or even if you're a bank, sometimes you go for the free version. Well, again, a lot of people will go for the free version. All right, we're developers, you know, especially as personal developers, we don't want to pay for anything. We want everything for free, um, and that that's good. But for instance, the likes of the, the the reason it works well for Couchbase is they are an enterprise company. They're not making money from little developers. They're making it from the big enterprise companies who need to pay the money. So again, due licensing it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and most of the time, you're going to find the developers who want the free version of your software. Um, but it does work in, uh, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, but if we are going to use due licensing, we should make sure that our open source repos are up to date. They are you know, fully patched, et cetera. Because the people who use our free version are as equally as important as the people who pay. All right? So we need to make sure we look after them. OK? Awesome. Is there another question?
This is a great one. All right. Yeah. I love this question. So the, his question was, in my experience, how can I uh, persuade people to open source like a client or an employer or whatever? So I get this question quite a lot. And the way is licensing. Make sure that they know that whatever, make sure A, that they know about licenses, explain it to them. So for instance, you could say the GPL license, you know, if they, if they need to use that one. If they have patents, etc., you could say the Apache license. Make sure they know about licensing. Make sure they know that they're not giving away their software. This is the thing that kind of get, gets into a lot of people's heads, kind of be it uh, a client, if you're making client software, or your employer. They think that by open sourcing their code base, they're giving away their software. Make sure they know that's not the case, all right? Um, and talk to them about licensing. This is, this is the the easiest way to persuade people is just not give them the knowledge, basically let them know that it's worth it. Just, just fight the corner for it, man. But basically, yeah, the, uh, the biggest way is licensing. Explain that to them. Explain they're not going to get ripped off. That's the biggest one. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, question? Uh, what's the best way to attract uh, contributors in uh, open source or free software? Sure. Um, Especially, uh, so the best... The best So if you have, I mean, if, you, if, if you're lucky enough to, to kind of have started a huge project uh, to, to encourage contributors, again, all of these points, make sure that everybody knows they're a good part of that project. Maybe make sure every contributor feels welcome. And to get contributors in, break the project down so it's modular. Break it down into pieces so that developers find those pieces instead of the big project itself. It'll attract a much bigger pool of developers. Yeah. Yeah? It is difficult to find time, Ex especially as I was saying, if you already have that bit of software to break that down is very difficult, but it's something to keep in mind for future pieces of software, especially we should build them modularly if we're going to open source them so people can find the smaller pieces instead of the big bit. Yeah? Awesome. Uh, so any other yeah, question there? Right. How can you make money with it? Again, that, that ties back to the, the, like the due licensing model. Uh, we, li we use licenses smart to make sure that we can make money from it. Um, again, developers want things for free, so it, it can be difficult. Uh, but it's just about getting that balance right in licensing. Yeah? So if you offer the software as a service, open source you know, parts of it, you know, the auth system, open source process workers, whatever. Um, but yeah, like, I, like I, I pointed out with the dual licensing, it's definitely not impossible to make money with software, with open source software at all. all right. Is that it? Yeah? Well, again, thank you guys for coming. Much, much appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>